back in our Father's Word, book of Titus. We're going to begin here with chapter 2 in a moment. Remember, the theme for the book of Titus was set in the 15th verse of chapter 1. And it goes, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. That, that says it all. You're going to find in the second chapter that God is very specific. When you understand his word, it is, it is specific, it is to the point, and it gives you correct doctrine, and don't ever let anyone take that away from you. It is God's love for you that he sent his son in his, in his stead as Emmanuel, God with us, to pay that price so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be pure. That is to say, we all fall short, but when you repent, you're pure. And to you, all things are pure. That's a mindset that is very important in carrying forth the Word of God. So, having said that, Titus, meaning protected, you find out in Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, that uh, Titus was a Greek. And Paul had sent him to Crete, which was which Crete being about 140 miles long and 30 miles wide, to establish churches, to set officials in those churches. But to be specific in what you would have those officials teach. And naturally, what was it they were to teach? Not their word, but the word of God. Chapter 2 and verse 1, and it reads, But speak or teach, he refers to Titus, thou the things which become sound doctrine. Don't you go off into any tangents. Don't you listen to any false teachers, prophets. You stick with the word and you stick with it, I mean, religiously. That is to say, strictly spiritually. Our Father's word. Sound doctrine is teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and explaining in detail, precisely, the Father's emotions, decisions, and judgments. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, that, that's, that's to, be, to be sensible, grave, that means honorable, temperate, that means having a lot of patience, sound in faith, and that means not wishy-washy, not this way one minute or that way one minute, or going by what men say, but what God says, sound doctrine. And in charity, that means in love, love of God. If you do not have love of God, there's no way you can ever teach. If you do not have love of God, there's no way you can get along with people. And in patience to rounded out. Uh, <clears throat> they must be vigilant in the word and carry it forth. The aged men would be the elders who's setting forth in the church. That is to say, who, who would teach the word, would explain the word, would fulfill the word, and keep it what sound doctrine. And doctrine, or the, or, or that is the teachings of God through the Son, in detail, and, and with these other um, characteristics added to this, it's precise. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, that they, they love Father, and they <clears throat> do that, that is uh, honorable, not false accusers, that means not a lot of gossiping or spreading bad word, nor given to much wine, a, a little wine for the good of the tummy, as Peter says, but not, not to a, a wine bibber, teachers of good things. This is always think positive, that's what he's saying. If you want to be pleasing to God, you are going to think positive. It's real easy to be negative about everything. And if you're not real careful, when you're negative about everything, you're letting your flesh speak, not your spirit body. It's your flesh body that's talking. You, you want to be, you want to say good things when it is at least possible and believe in that and be teachers of good things. And, of course, there's nothing 
better than the Word of God to teach, to correctly uh, add to uh, discipline, and uh, to hold people, hold them by not fear, but by the love of God. It is, if you're going to be a successful teacher with the sound doctrine of Almighty God, you're not going to hold people by fear, teaching a God that is out to zap somebody every time they make a missed move. No, God loves his children. God is very forgiving, and he resents those that would take advantage of his children. But why? Because he's a loving father. Don't, don't ever let anyone take that away from you. You cannot read these scriptures, which are from our Father. You cannot read them without recognizing the fact our Father is a God of love. That he loves his children. He gives them every opportunity. As long as what? As long as you stay in sound doctrine. As long as you have that charity, that is to say that love foremost, and that you're a teacher of good things, not junk. Not traditions of men. Verse 4, listen carefully. That they may teach the young women to be sober. That means to be wise. To make wise decisions. To love their husbands and to love their children. <clears throat> now, in telling you how specific our father is, this word husbands here, is not the normal word in the Greek used for husband. And I must call it to your attention, the word used here is philandros. And, and uh, well, what does philandros is husband? Yeah, it's a very special husband. It puts, it puts specifics on this verse. Example. If you have a husband who beats you, knocks your teeth out, harms the children, you're to love him? Would God give us that kind of instruction? Of course not. Then you're not being specific, and that's why you need to understand the Greek word husbands in philandros. Philandros, you, you know what? Philadelphia means, it means the city of brotherly love. And Phil Andrus means a husband that loves. A husband that loves his family. A husband that loves his children. A husband that provides for his family. Then the wife should love him. He puts, he is very specific. He puts boundaries on the word of getting along and having peace. A woman married to a fool, if she listens to him, is a bigger fool than he is. And I'm not trying to cause trouble in families. But the thing is, if we go back, here, here we have Timothy, right before this. If we go back to uh, Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, this is a husband, and specifically of those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So you see, God is very specific. So when a woman has a husband of love, that is to say a, a husband that provides for the family, that takes care of the family, then she should love him. Love in return. Then you have a solid Christian family, a family of faith. It is very important. As a matter of fact, in the last, uh, last lecture, I had a letter from a lady, and I'm not mentioning any names or states. But her husband beat her so bad, and yet somebody, he had put her on such a guilt trip that if she didn't come back to him, she was disobeying God. She knew if she went back to him, he would kill her. So you see, he was not a philandrous certainly had, would not match that at all. I, I use that example to show you that God is specific. God doesn't expect you to be unequally yoked, and um, this is, but that you should have a loving family. Every family has problems, but do you know how you work those problems out if, there, if it's even the least possibility that you can get along? is with God. 
And when one refuses God, then it makes that very difficult. Because you don't have a husband of love then. You have a husband of something else. This is why our father is so specific. And to love their children, that is just as normal as it can be for a real mother. A mother will do for a child it is a beautiful thing to see a mother and a child and how that mother loves that child. Verse 5, to be discreet, that means be sensible, use common sense, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so it is to be discreet and to use good judgment, to work as the family unit, a family that works together, a family that studies God's word together, was a family that will stay together. It is a family that will be blessed of God. Our father, again, he's very specific, and that's why he gives us these rules. Six, young men, likewise exhort to be sober-minded. You, young men, you be able to practice self-control. It is, in youth, there are many times you can get some pretty scattered ideas. And we all have to learn from maturity of growing up, of how to react and interact, how to gain by experiences, but most of all, to, to, to practice self-control, the sober-minded. How, how best can you practice self-control? Common sense. You know what is right and you know what is wrong. And as long as you practice self-control, you're going to have um, people that will come along and say, try this and try that and try this way and try that way. Take a good look at them. See how they're doing with it. If their eyes, if their old pupils are dilated and they look all messed up, you don't want to go there. That's idiocy. Don't want any part of that. If, if a person, you know, the most beautiful feeling in the world is to feel the touch of the living God. What a high. What a beautiful feeling to hear that, feel that love and understanding and charity that God brings into our families and our homes. Practice self-control to stay in that. And you will be a very wise young man. You will not be uh, led off into the ways of the world, which certainly God will never bless. And you're never going anywhere. Again, when you as a young person start planning your life, and remember what we read back in chapter 5, 1 Timothy, verse 8. If you don't take care of your own family, than an infidel. Do you understand where that puts you in the eyes of God? You're in pretty bad shape. Practice self-control. Use common sense. Don't be drawn aside by some fool or idiot. Verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptibleness, gravity, that means honesty, and sincerity. Common sense and in being very sincere in what you do. Don't play church. Don't play that you love God. Either you do or you don't. And, and that pattern in your life is a good thing to have, to follow that pattern. The pattern set forth by good works, by sound doctrine, by a loving family, and by the people around you earn their love by leading, directing, guiding, cooperating, and being a good citizen of the community. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, protect your credibility. When you teach God's word and, and in your own life, 
don't give anybody an advantage of being able to say something bad about you unless it's a lie. That you can't you can't work with that too much other than mark that person and mark them as a false accuser because that's what they are. But always using common sense and sound doctrine um, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Well, what is he talking about? The Word of God. And you following in the footsteps of those that have gone on before us and setting those standards and ways that bring happiness. And most of all, you know, in this world, we as Christians are here. But we have a great, great advantage if you take advantage of it. Our Father blesses us. You have that advantage to always succeed. To have that <clears throat> reputation that no one can really find anything against you. They may try to talk against you, but then when it's proven that they're a liar, they have nothing but shame in their lap. So... Your credibility is a very important thing because you are a Christ man. You are a man, a woman, or a child of God. And let it be said, wherever you walk, there goes a child of God by your actions and by your ways. That Father always takes care of his own. And that uh, when you protect your own credibility, you see... When it comes to people hearing you and listening to you, that's when your credibility is so very valuable. You cannot play both sides of the fence. That's not to say we're all, not all going to make mistakes at time. We will. But on repentance, it's totally forgiven. Get it straight. Get back in the walk with Almighty God. Know that He loves you enough. It's forgiven. And protect that credibility whereby people will pay heed to your advice, pay heed to your counsel. And when you want your perfect counsel, let it be the Word of God, for it is perfect. Your way in presenting it, presenting it is sound speech that you'll never have to apologize for, because God's Word always, I do mean always, comes to pass exactly as it's written. <clears throat> Verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. And answering again means gainsaying, just yippity, 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 always crazy, always complaining, just blah, 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 blah. Okay, never quite happy. Hey, listen, if, um, servants, when you're hired in a job and you're doing it, don't, don't whoever's hiring you do what they say that's what you're being paid for that's your contract that's your reputation as, as long as it is decent and honorable and don't bad mouth him about it you're taking his 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 salary you, you are are um, a worker for that organization whatever it might be business job and if you will do a better job than anyone else, you won't stay there long. You'll move up, 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 and up. Why? Because God blesses those that do it His way. So here you have a perfect example. Whatever you do, don't be a gainsayer, answering again and again. That's a good way to be without a job. That's a good way that nobody wants you necessarily. Always just bickety, bickety, picky, 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 all right? Be happy with what you're doing. Make it better. Always make your life better and make it better for those around you. And you will move up and up. That's what's important. That's, well, what is that called? God's blessings. Verse 10. Not prolonging, lining, that means stealing. Don't take anything or credit for anything that isn't yours. But showing all good fidelity, that means conviction, and, and uh, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Um, in other words, when, 
when you bring forth that good doctrine and when you live it, you have God's blessings in every way. You just, you know, this is the love of Almighty God for His children. And I know some are going to say, well, I, it never blesses me that way. Well, what do you do? Do you Are you concise in following his advice here? Because if you are, uh, you're blessed. If not, I can tell you right quick what your problem is. You've got to do it his way. Self-control. Love. Loving family. Loving God. Producing in the community. Teaching a good word. Living a good word whereby your credibility is right on top and no one can say anything against you so everybody will listen to you basically everybody that loves God so never never take that that isn't belonging and always um, be convincing in God's word that it is true and that it is a blessing to all that take hold of it to all that will adhere to it you don't have to take any shortcuts. All you have to do is be honest in good sound doctrine, the Word of God. And God will always bless you, whereby it is marked. And, uh, and uh, the, that doctrine that God is, is our Savior in all things. Well, what, what, how many things again was that? All things. He has an answer for everything. The truth will set you free. I know you have certain Christians that will say, well, there are some things God will not forgive you for. Well, if you want to listen to a liar, listen to it. Isn't it better to listen to God's word? All things. There is only one unforgivable sin, and if you're not one of God's elect, you never even have to worry about it anyway because it doesn't apply to you. And it doesn't happen until after the false Christ appears on earth. But to be fair in bringing forth the truth whereby people can amplify in their lives that truth that blesses, that grows, that is so catching that it brings you into the saving power of Almighty God, which means His blessings rain down on your family and bless you and those that you come in contact with. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That word grace, as you well know, is charis. And it is the charis and the charisma, the love and the forgiveness of Almighty God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. In what way? In Christ, the very Son who loved you enough that he paid that price on the cross, that knowing you're going to fall short. I, I wish I could say that we could all just be perfect. But we're, we're in flesh, and flesh is not perfect. But praise be to God, his love for us and our love for him, he forgives. He gives us a fresh start when we do fall short. That's what a Savior is. That's what salvation is. Is to reach to you and lift you and bring you into His saving charis, His charisma, His love, His blessings. You know, to be in good standing with the living God is an awesome, awesome thing. And the reason He's very specific and puts boundaries on things, such as a husband that we were doing earlier. It's so that you have common sense in being able to ascertain and to determine what it is God would have you do. Do you know what it always comes back to? Honesty, straightforwardness, but most of all, truth. Truth in God's Word that always brings forth blessings and understanding that surpasses all things of this world. Stay in his word, stay in sound doctrine, and you will always, always be blessed. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness 
in worldly lust, we should live soberly, that means honestly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Um, in, don't, don't, don't read over that. Not only in this world, but as it was for God's elect, even in the first earth age. But in, in this dispensation of time, you don't have to wait till heaven to gain the knowledge and the wisdom and the blessings of God, you can bring it. It comes to you in this world, in this present world, in this present time, with our present Father. He's here, but you've got to reach out to Him. You've got to let Him know that you love Him. You've got to let Him know that you follow Him. And that you not only enjoy the blessings but you love him for it because that's what he wants from you is your love verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ and i feel that time is very soon we know we've got some rough spots in the road for some people but if you are in the walk with god you know that be, that being witnessing against the false Christ is a piece of cake. Why? Because the Holy Spirit witnesses through you, does it for you, whereby not a hair on your head can be touched. And looking forward to the second advent is a beautiful thing. You know, well, well how could you say that, dear brother, that looking forward to it is a blessed thing? Because a lot of people fear it fear and ignorance like he's coming back to judge and I'm frightened no if you're doing his work according to these scriptures you're blessed okay he's his judgment to you is is to move you further up the ladder to bring you blessings and happiness forever that is that hope that is sure and earnest hope in him knowing that we have that before us. And that's why you look forward to that day, because it is a good day. It is the day that we can take Satan and tromp him right into the ground, as spiritually speaking, and make him look like what he is before your brothers and sisters that are just a little bit ignorant of what God's Word truly says. By the very words from your mouth with the Holy Spirit doing the speaking. That's why you can look forward with joy to that time, that day, and the work that you must do even before that appearing, whereby you are blessed. 14, who gave himself, listen carefully, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What, what is this purify unto himself a peculiar people? You remember the theme I told you back in verse 15 of chapter 1? Unto the pure all things are pure. He wants you to be pure by loving him. Now what is this he gave himself for us? that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Oh, they've got it wrong. I mean, you know, there are teachers that say, if you're divorced, you're penalized. You can't do this and you can't do that. And if you, if you do this and, you know, you, it's a no-no. You can't, you know, you can't do I don't care if you repent, you, you will not forgive it. Don't let some false religion come into your heart. It says very clearly, all sin. He forgives all sin. And when you repent, He paid an awesome price to redeem you from that. So don't you let some offbeat, would-be, so-called religionist rob you by causing you to be helped by fear and move to the back of the church because you're not good enough to be up front. That's a false teaching. False apostles. All sin is forgiven. He's not a halfway savior. 
He's not a savior that can only, he's just so weak, he can't get this done. He is powerful, all forgiving. And don't you ever let anyone take that away from you. Do you see how precise the word of God is when you explain it? Good doctrine, good sound doctrine. That peculiar people is a people that are purity bound. They mess up a little bit, but hey, that's all right. He forgives us. Why? Because he loves you. Verse 15, to complete the chapter. These things speak, or these things you teach, and exhort, you correct by them, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. In other words, don't you allow some knucklehead to come in on the side and start teaching false doctrine, crippling Christ's very saving power with his nonsense. You rebuke and correct. That's edit. I mean, you edit out junk. You get it out of your church. You get it out of your congregation. Well, dear brother, God is a God of love. Love is tough love. It means to get rid of junk. You do not let a tender one be abused by some crackpot that claims to be a man or woman of God. You don't, you rebuke. Well, well Jesus was a Jesus of love. Jesus planted a, a whip of nine, a cat of nine tails and laid it to the back of the money changers and the people in the very house of God that didn't belong. That's authority. Why? Because he did Because he loved the children that tried, that wanted to do what's right. So a true man or woman of God makes a stand. When you stand against falseness, you teach a sound doctrine. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please?